<clears throat> right, and we're off again, so just get some water to swell out my mouth. So the next one we're going to do, if you are watching from America, you will um, probably know what this one is. Um, if you're living in the UK, you'll probably know what this one is, but you won't have seen it quite as much as the Americans will have done. Because this is um, the biggest selling, definitely single malt, possibly scotch, possibly spirit, probably not spirit, but possibly scotch as well as single malt in the US. Um, because half of what is made um, from this particular distillery goes over to the US. And this is this one, Glenlivet. Uh, now, it's actually the Glenlivet, and I'll go into a little bit as to why it's called the Glenlivet. So, Glenlivet is a region in um, Speyside, and here's where it is on the map. Um, now, in uh, the early 1800s, the thing to bear in mind is, Whiskey was a part of Scottish culture and it was really, really popular, but up to 1823, for the vast majority of it, it was illegal. Um, and it was one of those where it was part of its culture, but it was illegal. So you had two very separate camps within Scotland. You had illicit distillers that would go off into the, the wilds of Scotland and hide away and distill spirit and make whiskey. And then you would have part of the government, the tax men, what were called gauges, who would go out and try and find these illicit stills and destroy them or get the money off them for tax reasons and then basically destroy their, their stills that were like these mini stills kind of, you know, that you could carry on your back and you'd travel off into the hills and you'd make your whiskey and then you'd come back and you'd smuggle it in, in bottles or whatever you could carry it in and then sell it and make money from it. In 1823, um, King George the... Shit fourth, maybe fifth, maybe sixth, one of the King Georges um, was in Edinburgh and Scotch whisky was already really, really highly regarded and very, very popular. And even though there were some legal distilleries uh, down in the lowlands of Scotland, kind of around Edinburgh and Glasgow, in the highlands, it was illegal, it was, uh, you know, it was rife um, and it was, it was causing massive problems for the government, but it was still highly regarded. And apparently King George the <laughs> visited Edinburgh in 1823 and actually asked for whiskey from the Glenlivet region because this particular region was really well known for really high quality whiskey. So, in a, later on in 1823, it turns out that all of a sudden this Excise Act was introduced where essentially it reduced the cost of buying a license to distill whiskey. And in the Glenlivet region, in amongst all these illicit distillers, was a gentleman called George Smith who was the first one to actually purchase a license to distill whiskey. So he is regarded as, he, it's been written in some places that he is the, the, the Glenlivet is the first official malt whiskey distillery, but um, there were some distilleries in, low, in um, the lowlands of Scotland that were legal, that had paid, and had paid the fairly extortionate money to get the license to distill officially. Um, but it's kind of a nice little marketing thing. And, and George Smith is, is that highly regarded that you know, he is mentioned on the labels and he's quite heavily pushed at the distillery. So we'll go with it and we'll say that he was one of the first, but certainly in the, in the north of Scotland, in the Highlands, he was the first one to purchase this, this license to distill. Now, that didn't go down particularly well with the other illegal distillers because it was very much an us and a them, and it was violent, it was, these guys were going out to try and find the stills to destroy them and if they got outnumbered or if they got were walking across fields and through the forest trying to find these stills and there were local communities that relied on this trade of whiskey to actually keep themselves working and trading and keep themselves uh, you know earning money they'd be there with literally pitchforks and flaming torches getting these guys to fuck off or they were going to kill them and it was it was violent um, so for somebody to then turn around and go, do you know what, I'm doing this officially, I'm actually going to work with the government, with these illegal guys that had kind of grown up through the years of being anti-government and we fight them, you know, this is our livelihood and, and fuck the government and all this lot, it was a real kind of like, well, hang on a minute, what do you think you're doing? So he, he's legendary, you know, it's one of these legendary things where he actually had a pair of pistols 
that were donated, that were given to him, not donated, given to him by the lead of Abalawa, who was very impressed with his whiskies and actually gave him a pair of pistols that he used to carry with him day and night so that when um, he was getting threatened or attacked by, physically attacked by people that were trying to essentially burn down his official distillery, he could see them off. Um, now apparently this pair of pistols are still at the distillery. Um, George Smith's name is um, on all the, the marketing, you know, he is the founder of the distillery. Um, and it's a really kind of like bloody history as to, um, and behind this, this actual, this, this whiskey. Within a decade, in the Glenlivet region, um, all the all the distilleries and all, all sorry all the illicit stiller, distillers were either long gone or they'd actually gone official and they bought licenses themselves because it was one of those things where it's like well if you can't beat them join them um, and it became very very highly regarded this particular region and anywhere in Glenlivet was very highly regarded for a good quality of whiskey so much to the point that everybody else started calling themselves Glenlivet um, Glenlivet something and being the original. George Smith and his um, family and, and the, the, the owners that came subsequently were like, well, hang on a second, you know, we were the, we were the original, we're the Glenlivet, we're the real stuff. And yet other people were distilling in the region, calling themselves Glenlivet, going, oh yeah, this is Glenlivet, honest. Um, so in 1884, um, the company actually won a legal battle where they were the only ones that were allowed to be called the Glenlivet. And that's why on the label it specifically says the Glenlivet. What other distilleries had basically started doing was they would call themselves something something Glenlivet. So you used to get a Macallan Glenlivet, Abalawa Glenlivet. They used to put it on as a suffix essentially to say we're from this region, we are just as good as the Glenlivet. And this carried on until about the mid 80s. I mean, you know, fairly recently this was still going on. Um, purely as a kind of, you know, a, a marketing thing of we want to be associated with the quality of this other whiskey. So, this is a whiskey I don't think I've had, considering it's such a major brand. I genuinely can't remember ever having this. I probably have, but I have absolutely no idea. Um, oh, I need to point out as well, because I've just remembered, um, the original distillery is about a mile north of where it is now. They actually moved in about 1858, um, just because they needed some, uh, they needed a big distillery because it was doing so well. So. Post-prohibition uh, in 1933, Glenlivet was one of the first whiskies to basically be exported out to the US when the demand started growing. And that's why, because they got in there early, they're a very highly regarded product. We'll find out just how good it is, but I'm willing to bet it's going to be half decent because it, it's the biggest selling, um, certainly single malt, if not scotch all round, in the US. Now, it's owned by um, Pernod Ricard, and their aim currently is to be globally the number one single malt scotch in sales. So they are catching up Glenfiddich fast and having such a dominant market in America is definitely gonna help. So, moment of truth because I genuinely can't remember having this at all. Quite light on the color. There's a nice color to it, but it's, it's on the lighter side, you know, it's not what I call pale, but it's on the lighter amber side. Ooh. Bit, a bit fierier than I thought it was going to be on the nose. There's a little bit of pear on there and some light fruits, kind of grapiness as well. Oh, now that's really coming through. Almost orangey as well, like orange peel and pear and that kind of sharp tangy um, fruitiness to it. Yeah, definite orange peel on that. That's really coming through now. bit more woodiness than I was expecting. There's more oakiness to it than I thought there was going to be. There's a definite orange peel kicking through though, which is actually quite pleasant. And it doesn't, it doesn't burn, it doesn't prickle. It doesn't have a hit that I thought might have with that woodiness coming through. I thought as I was going to swallow, it was going to really dry up and be quite harsh, but it's not. And there's a definite orange tang to it. Really quite, yeah, quite considerable kind of an orange peel, um, it then turns into like orange soda, but kind of like a, not an artificial, kind of a weird artificial orange soda. It reminds me of a combination of like orange panda pops, but not as sugary sweet. And also there's a company called Stewart's based in America that do um, 
cream soda. And I know that because my wife absolutely loves cream soda. But they do an orange and cream drink as well, which is a, like a really nice kind of sweet orange fizzy drink. But it's not sugary sweet. It's quite a refreshing sweet orange drink. And there's elements of that in it. It's really quite nice. Yeah, definite orange, orangey feel to it. Pleasant. Again, not burning, and I keep thinking it will be because there is this woodiness to it, and I keep expecting it to really dry off and kind of hit the back of my throat and be a bit harsh, but it's not. Again, I can see definite orange, like really full on. Maybe my, my taste buds are going, you know, we're on what, Dram 47 now. Maybe I'm just too much whiskey still going down my throat. But well, that's really pronounced, but very pleasant. Quite quite refreshing as well. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely there. The woodiness is slightly, slightly too much. But I can kind of see why that's a really, really popular brand because there is quite a lot to there. There's quite a distinctive flavor to it. It probably mixes quite well, which is another thing in America which they're quite big on in terms of cocktails. And I can imagine that in cocktail is actually really good, particularly with that fruitiness that's in there, because that's going to go really well with other mixers. It's a decent whiskey, don't get me wrong. Again, you're probably looking at about 30, 35 quid. I don't know whether that's slightly too expensive in terms of, I think there's a little bit of a premium on that because of what the name is. But it's good. It is, yeah, it's a good whiskey. Um, di distinct, it's got a character all of its own, which I like. I like the fact it stands out. Maybe a little bit too woody for my liking. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want more than, than 25 mils because I think it would dry out eventually. Um, definitely a good mixer. And yeah, another solid dependable whiskey. Um, just that orangey feel to it. it definite to me personally, and you may not pick that up. You might get some fruitiness to it, but we all have different tastes. So I'm not gonna say if you don't taste orange peel, then there's something wrong with your taste buds. There could quite easily be something wrong with mine. but that distinctiveness makes it stand out uh, and I, pr I appreciate that, I think that's quite nice. So, decent that, decent, decent, decent. Um, I would give Glenfiddich the edge in terms of the, what I enjoyed and therefore I would say Glenfiddich deserves to be the world's biggest selling whiskey more than that does. But they've got half a chance with that because I think that will go down pretty well. So uh, yeah, interesting. I don't remember having it before so it's nice to come back to things if, uh, if it's been such a long time. Good stuff that. Uh, that's me for the night. I am going to do some ironing now. <sighs> Joy. But uh, we shall keep going and um, I may see some of you at uh, Newcastle Whiskey Festival on Saturday, although this is probably going out on that night. So I've already been. I might have seen you today, I think. I don't I'm getting myself confused. Um, so yeah, I'll uh, see you in the next one. Cheers.